David Lynch has a unique place in cinematic history. Despite making films that are mostly inaccessible and unappealing to general audiences, he has had a relatively steady career behind the camera, created one of the most critically acclaimed and talked about shows in TV history, has had his name turned into an adjective for other works that are similar to his, and has become one of the most iconic directors of all time. But how did he reach this point? How did a dirt poor amateur filmmaker, art school flunky and animal dissecting weirdo rise to become one of the most influential and iconic directors in the world? Well, it all started with his first feature, a film whose story is both humble and extraordinary. A tale of how one man's near single-minded love for art helped usher in one of cinema's strangest films. This is the story of Eraserhead. Hello. We're all very happy to be here tonight. Um, first of all, I'd like to introduce my boys. This is uh, Chucko, and this is Buster, and this is Pete. I'm David Lynch, and this is Bob, and this is Dan. And we just wanted to get together and thank all of the people that have supported Eraserhead uh, through the years. Also, um, the boys wanted me to uh, wish you uh, peace and happiness. And um, these guys aren't just a bunch of goofballs. They know that there's plenty of suffering in the world. And they uh, spent many years with little iron hooks in their backs up on uh, Sunset Boulevard. And, uh, but they tell me uh, that there's this all-pervading happiness underneath everything. And the more time I spend with them, the more I believe it. And so we wish you peace and happiness and long live Eraserhead. Thanks a million. In his freshman year of high school, David Lynch had figured out his path in life. He was going to lead the art life, dedicating his life to the pursuit of making art. He had been introduced to this lifestyle by artist Bushnell Keeler, the father of one of Lynch's high school friends. This kid, Toby Keeler, who didn't go to Hammond High School, he went to private school. And Toby told me his father was a painter. And that you know, kind of realization that you could be a painter popped, you know, blew all the wiring, you know, and that's what I wanted to do from that second. He was joined on this journey by a man who would become a frequent collaborator and David's best friend, Jack Fisk. The two of them rented a studio and painted together, went on a three-year pilgrimage to Europe, which lasted only 15 days due to David wasting all their savings on cokes and cigarettes, and then both enrolled at the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts, which was situated in the state's largest city, Philadelphia, a place which would have a profound influence on his art and on Eraserhead itself. At the time of Lynch's arrival, Philadelphia was a powder keg of poverty and poor race relations. Much of the white residents fled in the wake of World War II due to housing shortages and an influx of African Americans into the area, leading to a dwindling population. The city had been the site of one of America's first civil rights era race riots in 1964, an event that was sparked by several incidents of police brutality against African Americans, which led to the destruction of 225 stores, many of which never reopened. All of that, along with a severe drug trade problem, made Philadelphia a dangerous place, something which Lynch felt, even though he was unaware of the city's history and the politics behind its many social ills. There was a thick, thick fear in the, in the, in the air. There was a feeling of sickness, corruption, of racial hatred. It was this atmosphere of terror which would serve as vital inspiration for David's work, not the least of which was the effect it would have on Eraserhead's aesthetic, as when Lynch went location scouting for the film, he set out to find places in Los Angeles that had the same look and feel as Philadelphia, to try and recreate the same feeling of threat he had felt at the time. The city itself was not the only source of inspiration for Eraserhead which David received at the time, as two people would enter his life and have a profound effect on the film's story. One was his first wife, Peggy Reevee, and the other was their daughter, Jennifer, who they had shortly before getting married. Though as to how these two would influence Eraserhead, we'll have to wait. It was while at the Academy that David took his earliest steps into filmmaking and made his first short. David had been an avid experimenter in art since early on, 
And one day he got an idea for his most ambitious experiment yet, a painting that moved. To execute this concept, he created six men getting sick, six times, a one minute animation projected onto a sculpted screen which loops six times and is about, well, six men getting sick. It was followed by his second film, The Alphabet, a mix of animation and live action, which is this nightmare story of a young woman learning her ABCs and was inspired by a story of Peggy's niece reciting the alphabet in her sleep. So I would say that this was his first foray into dream logic, a vital component to his style as a director. It was also the first of David's films to be shown in a movie theater and won him a grant from the American Film Institute, which allowed him to make his third and longest piece yet, The Grandmother. The Grandmother was an immediate evolution in his style and storytelling, as not only did it have more elaborate art design, but also a more coherent story. Such story being about a young boy with a severe backfighting problem and abusive parents who were more than willing to punish him for it. To escape from his abuse, the boy grows a grandmother, a symbol of warmth, as Lynch explains. Though this brief comfort is short-lived, as his grandmother chokes, croaks, and there's a scene in a graveyard where he sees her ghost, after which he turns into a plant or a kidney, yeah, when I said more coherent, I meant coherent for a Lynch film. On the David Lynch weirdness tier list, The Grandmother is about a C. But aside from a jump in art design and storytelling quality, The Grandmother showed another evolution in his style, his sound design, and helping him create the film soundscape was the first of many important collaborators who would work with him on Eraserhead, Alan Splett. And I look over and I see this guy He's like a beanpole in a shiny black suit, 15, 20 year old suit. And I shake his hand and I can feel the bones rattle in his arm. That was Al. And this guy was as straight as an arrow. Splat and Lynch worked tirelessly together to create the unique soundscape of the grandmother, spending nine hours every day for 63 days making and experimenting with sounds. And it was important for them to experiment, as none of the pre-existing sounds they had access to were right for the film, so they had to make up the grandmother's soundscape from scratch, Lynch providing abstract descriptions of what he wanted, sometimes even drawing pictures to somehow help with the process, and Splat would translate that into sound effects. It was a process of trial and error, and they had to deal with a lot of limitations, such as lacking a reverb device they needed for the grandmother's whistle, a problem they solved by re-recording the sound through a piece of aluminum heat ducting 15 times until it sounded right. The grandmother features a lot of ambient drones, something which would become a mainstay of his style, along with a more exaggerated and visceral sound design. Their hard work would pay off in two ways. The film would win prizes at multiple film festivals, and both Alan and David would be given a place in the American Film Institute, Splat becoming the head of their sound department, and David being invited as a fellow in their advanced film studies. Joined by Jack Fisk, David would move his family to Los Angeles to attend the American Film Institute, or AFI for short, where the idea of Eraserhead would start to germinate. At the time of Lynch's enrollment, AFI was situated in Greystone Manor, a 55-room mansion that was built by oil baron Edward Doheny in the late 20s, and he was joining some pretty illustrious company, AFI's first graduating class including filmmakers like Terence Malick of Badlands and the Thin Red Line fame, Paul Schrader, the screenwriter of Taxi Driver, Raging Bull, The Last Temptation of Christ, and the director of Mishima, A Life in Four Chapters along with future collaborators like Caleb Dajanel and Tim Hunter, both of whom would direct three episodes of Twin Peaks. The curriculum was loose at the time. If you wanted to learn something, somebody would be around to tell you about somebody that knew that, or you could drop in on a class if you wanted to, but you could do a lot of your own work. And this freedom would fit David well, as he is a great believer in learning by doing, rather than being taught directly and has a great animosity towards schooling, something which can be seen in his second short, The Alphabet, which he describes as a nightmare about the fear connected with learning. Though there was one class which greatly interested and influenced him, 
The film analysis class headed by Frank Daniel, where students were assigned to analyze a film from one perspective, be it the editing, writing, sound or acting. It was there that Linz first began to think about how films work and where he learned the writing method which he uses to this day. This method, called sequencing paradigm, entails writing down 70 elements on note cards, each one representing a scene, and then organizing those cards into a coherent sequence of events. It was a simple to understand method which would prove invaluable to David in the making of Eraserhead. And one can see a dramatic shift in his writing ability between it and the grandmother, Eraserhead having a more coherent and connected series of events, as well as a sense of escalation, whereas the grandmother often feels random with little connecting each scene. And it was during this phase in his education that David began work on his first feature screenplay, Gartenbach. Based on one of his paintings, Gartenbach was a story about infidelity, which had some similarities to Eraserhead, though the project never advanced beyond the screenwriting phase. It was originally about 40 pages long, and some of the teachers at AFI, Frank Daniel included, encouraged David to stretch it to future length. But when writing was done, Lynch had lost interest in the project, feeling that all the original ideas which he had loved were buried under the additions he made to them. A lot of people tried to help me, but the bits I liked started floating further apart, and in between was the stuff I didn't like. It was during this time that the idea for Eraserhead started to take seed, and after falling out of love with Gartenbach, Lynch stormed into the AFI offices and called the project off, saying that he wanted to do Eraserhead instead. They were at first enthusiastic about the project, but only because they thought it would be a short film, as the script which Lynch turned in was 20 pages long, and the general rule in screenwriting is that one page equates to a minute on screen. As to how 21 pages of screenplay could turn into a feature, well, that was mainly due to Lynch's unfamiliarity with screenplay formats, and according to him, it was much of a script as it was a... There wasn't really a script. It was a 22-page uh, thing. And um, I don't know what people really got from that script. It was mostly descriptions with very minimal stage directions, and it would go through significant changes throughout the production, the film's first half resembling the script almost word for word, while the second half veers off into a different direction, the film's original ending getting changed significantly. So, thinking that the film would be about 20 to 40 minutes long and that it would take six weeks to film, AFI granted him a $10,000 budget and set them to work. The final film, however, would end up an hour and 29 minutes and it would take Lynch almost five years to complete. David Lynch has described Eraserhead as a dream of dark and troubling things. As to what that means, well, he's not saying. David Lynch has described his uh, film Eraserhead in this manner, a dream of dark and troubling things. And uh, would you like to expound on that a little? No. <laughs> but when one watches Eraserhead, that description feels apt, elusive though it may be, because the story of Eraserhead operates on dream logic. It centers around Henry Spencer, a worker at a printing factory, whose already dour existence is made all the more miserable when he gets a girl pregnant and is forced to marry her. And just to make matters worse, the child she gives birth to is, uh, well... What follows is a psychological downward spiral, as Henry's relationship with his wife unravels, his chances with his neighbor fizzle away, and the baby becomes more and more demanding, almost sadistically so, taking over Henry's life bit by bit until he can't handle it anymore. But that's only the surface of Eraserhead's story. Interjected between the more coherent story bits are dreamlike vignettes that seem disconnected with the main narrative unless one analyzes their thematic purpose, such as the zombie-like man in the planet, the weird stop-motion worm, Henry's nightmarish dream sequence where the baby takes over his body and his head gets turned into erasers, and of course the lady in the radiator, but we'll get to her later. It is these near incoherent and disconnected bits of dream logic that give Eraserhead its nightmarish atmosphere, the feeling that one is diving into the main character's and perhaps the director's subconscious mind. And that was the intent, as when David Lynch wrote Eraserhead, he did not think of what every element meant, but instead went by feeling and figured out the film's meaning later, as he has said, I felt Eraserhead, I didn't think it. Contributing to the film's nightmare atmosphere is the set design, an element so vital that it was the first thing that Lynch worked on when the project was greenlit. 
The film was shot entirely in Los Angeles, but when location scouting, Lynch sought after structures that looked as if they could belong in Philadelphia, such as old dilapidating factories to give the world of Eraserhead an industrial feel, almost like it mostly consists of rotting factories and warehouses. For the interior scenes, Lynch was lucky to gain exclusive access to the Greenstone Manor staples, though they were not as much staples as they were servants' quarters, garages, a greenhouse and storage area, so Lynch had enough room to both build sets and have accommodations for him and his crew. And much like his previous films, Lynch would do most of the work himself, acting as set designer and builder, with Alan Splatt and his brother John assisting. He would also do the makeup himself, not aware that as a director it was customary to allocate those duties to other departments. To him it was self-evident that he did most of the work himself, as that was what he had done as a painter, and so he assumed filmmaking would be the same. He would prove an efficient and cost-effective set designer, buying a large portion of the building materials from a studio that was closing down for as little as $100 and reusing them repeatedly throughout the shoot, along with gathering props from cast members' families or building them himself. And it was during this time that he built the film's most recognizable and infamous prop, the baby. How he made it is one of Eraserhead's most tightly held secrets, Lynch and every crew member maintaining what can only be described as a vow of silence when asked about it. Because of this, many theories have popped up, ranging from him having based it on a cow's fetus to him having used an actual cow fetus. Though the fact that it would have been impossible to preserve such a thing during the near 5 year shoot is reason enough to dismiss that theory, Lynch has good reason to maintain this silence. Much like how if a magician revealing the secret behind his tricks would ruin their appeal, Lynch explaining the baby's creation would diminish its effectiveness. As when watching the film, you're not supposed to think of the materials it was made of or how it was puppeteered. You're supposed to see it as a mutated demon child. The one thing we do know is that it was dubbed spite by the film's leading man, Jack Nance. What's really amazing about it is that it's just as effective now as it was when the film first came out, never losing its visceral horror, everything from the slimy and realistic texture of its skin to its ear-piercing cry making it one of the most terrifying horror monsters ever put on film. And although he probably did not use a cow fetus for the baby, there are a few props that were made of real organic materials like the umbilical cords used for this scene, which were the real thing and were obtained from a hospital. And Lynch had also done a lot of experimentation with organic materials, from relatively normal tests like allowing fruit to decay to see what it would look like, to some rather… suspect things like collecting dead birds and mice, pulling apart insects, and that time he dissected the cat. There needed to be, you know, certain things uh, discovered and… I love organic phenomenon, and that has led me to various things, and it led me to one day calling a veterinarian. And um, I asked him if he had a dead cat, and he said, no, sir, I don't. And I explained to him, he said, what do you want, what do you want a dead cat for? And I said, I want to... Um, study this cat and <clears throat> so something he 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 at first pegged me for a, a total nut cake and uh, then something caught him and he took my number and lo and behold ten minutes later this same guy veterinarian calls me and he says I have a cat it, I can't believe it. I got off the phone, two minutes later, in it comes. So I had had to set up uh, in my basement there. And I drove down and got the cat in a cardboard box. And um, just before lunch, I put it into a jar uh, filled with formaldehyde. And it went in like a slinky. It just lay down in the formaldehyde. And then I went upstairs and had lunch and came back down and I went to get the cat out of the jar and it had gotten rigor mortis. And this had a narrow top. It was like trying to pull a steel cat out of a, out of a glass jar. And uh, so <laughs> I finally got this thing out, there, out of there and I went to work. Uh, getting inside this cat and when I opened up the inside it was unbelievable. unbelievable 
the organs inside the cat were brilliant colors. And as soon as the air got to the organs, they started, the color just started draining out right before your eyes, just draining away before your eyes. There was a, um, a narrow tank coming up out of a, uh, the ground and it was surrounded by a donut of water. But just down at the bottom of the water, there was tar. Who knows how thick it was? And uh, tar preserves things. And the cat has served many purposes. But I had lowered this cat in there uh, and then about a year later came back and pulled the wire and the cat came out impregnated with tar. And I laid the cat down on the ground and came back another year later and it was a perfect marriage of cat and earth. Tar impregnated cat in earth. So, um, but studying this cat uh, was kind of, you know, important. It's probably a good thing that he has art as an outlet because God knows what he would do if he didn't. I joke, of course, as morbid as Lynch's fascination with decay is, it is probably nothing more than that. And as questionable as his treatment of the cat was, that experiment may have helped in the creation of Eraserhead. I imagine this scene was inspired by what he discovered. And it was thanks to this fascination for dead and dreary things that Lynch was able to create the world of Eraserhead, which was supposed to be a dystopian wasteland of rotting industrial buildings and factories where all plant life is either dried up or wilting. Though he could not do it himself. Unlike with his previous films, where he served almost every role behind the camera, he would need a crew this time, and one of the first members to join in was Doreen Small, who he met through Jack Fisk. Small's first job was simply to find props, but her role on set would soon expand to her becoming production manager and script assistant, something which would become a regular occurrence on set, as with such a small crew, people had to serve multiple roles. And unlike with his previous films, Lynch could not shoot Eraserhead himself, so he enlisted the help of Herb Cardwell, who he had met before in Philadelphia. Cardwell, wanting to get into industrial films, was happy to hop along and become the film's cinematographer, but he would only stay for about 9 months, as production travelled at a sluggish pace, and he had to leave for a better paying job. It was then that a man named Fred Elms would take over as cinematographer and stay for the remainder of the shoot. Despite the shift in personnel, Eraserhead's cinematography remained consistent, both Cardwell and Elms syncing with David's intended style for the film. Set style being a tightly controlled, exhaustively lit and immaculately textured black and white cinematography. And when I say tightly controlled, I mean it, as the level of detail and work that was put into each frame was intense, the crew often spending an entire night setting up for a single shot, mostly using small lightweight film lights called inkies, which they strategically placed around the set but also sometimes using softer lights, like in the lovemaking scene between Henry and his neighbor, where the harsher illumination of the inkies did not fit the mood. The reason for this extensive lighting was because Lynch and his cinematographers were trying to achieve the perfect balance between darkness and light, making sure that certain shots were dark enough to hide the background, hence giving them a feeling of the unknown, or a room to dream as Lynch calls it. This search for the right level of dark went on when the film stock was processed, as Lynch and Fred Elms had to send the stock back to the processing lab multiple times, never satisfied with how dark the film was, so much so that the workers there wondered if they were lighting the movie with a candle in a tunnel. Lynch is in fact so fastidious about people seeing his film with the right level of darkness that he had Criterion include a test on their Blu-ray for the film, so people can adjust the settings of their TV, or in my case a projector, to get the right experience. This is because he is very adamant about people seeing his films in ideal conditions to get what he considers to be the right experience, a theatre ideally, and although he is skeptical about whether it works as well on a TV screen, that can do as well. Just uh, don't watch it on your phone. Now if you're playing the movie on a telephone, you will never in a trillion years experience the film. You'll think you have experienced it, but you'll be <clears throat> cheated. It's a, such a sadness that you think you've seen a film on your fucking telephone. Get real.
It was not just the lighting which dragged on each shooting day, as when they were set dressing, the crew had to make several tests to see if the colors of the walls, makeup and costuming had the ideal look, painting over the walls several times to get the right shade of grey. This was one of the main reasons the shoot dragged on for so long, as Lynch wanted to get each shot just right. And that work paid off, as Eraserhead does not look like the amateur work of a film student, and has crisper and better lit cinematography than a lot of professionally made black and white films, despite its small budget. And it was thanks to this work that Eraserhead has not aged a day, still looking as great as it did at its premiere, and losing none of its mystique and atmosphere. As to why they chose to shoot on black and white, well, one explanation is that it is easier to hide imperfections in black and white, and in some cases it is cheaper than shooting in color, which is why a lot of first-time directors with low budgets resort to it. But that was not the case with Razorhead, as the exhaustive lighting and set designing needed for the film increased the shooting time, enhanced the budget. No, the choice of black and white was deliberate, because it helped create the world and atmosphere. There is an inherent unreality to black and white, as most people are used to experiencing the world in color, so something shot in black and white can feel not of this world or from another time, both apt descriptions for Eraserhead. The cinematography was not the only part of Eraserhead's atmosphere building, sound was another. Lynch has said that his films are 50% visual and 50% sound, so just as with the cinematography and set building, the sound design was extensive and experimental. And helping him with this was of course Alan Splett, the first member of the crew and the last one to work with David on it. Much like the grandmother, the soundscape of Eraserhead is mostly drones and other ambient sounds. But unlike the grandmother, Eraserhead's drone-laden soundtrack serves not only as atmosphere and ambience, but as world building, the sounds coming from a definitive source, the factories of Eraserhead's world. The soundscape is almost entirely dominated by the hum and buzz of industry, heard both outside and inside, giving this oppressive feeling that no matter where the characters are, they are never free from their dour reality. And when Lynch and Splat gave sound to organic things, they exaggerated them to an almost cartoonish degree, but made sure to make them sound sickening, enhancing the feeling that there is something off about Eraserhead's world. A cat chicken sounds rubbery and gurgling. And something as cute as newborn puppies suckling on their mother is made nauseating. They also continued using unconventional and creative ways to construct many of the sounds. As an example, the ambient sound heard in the love scene between Henry and his neighbor was created by sticking a microphone halfway into a bottle which was floating in a bathtub, which they then moved just gently enough to get an ethereal noise. It was not enough to just create the world with set design, sounds and cinematography, he also had to populate it with a cast. And lucky for him, the actors of Eraserhead seemed to almost fall right into place, Lynch finding the ideal person for each character with the first person he interviewed. He was introduced to the actors who played Mary, Charlotte Stewart, through Doreen Small, who was her roommate at the time. He already knew Judith Roberts who played Henry's neighbor, and it was she who brought on the actors for Mary's parents, Alan Joseph and Jeannie Bates the three of them having been in a theatre company together. But most important of all was Henry Spencer himself, who was played by Jack Nance. Mostly a theatre actor who had played minor roles in two previous films, Jack Nance would prove to be a perfect fit for Henry, able to depict his simmering anxiety and giving the perfect expression for the character, which came about when David told him Henry was a total blank. He would also prove extremely dedicated to the project, not just by staying on for the four and a half years it took to make it, but also by helping David with the prop building, the two working together to build this giant baby head. One must also appreciate the fact that he was willing to maintain that hairstyle for so long. It was through Nance that David met the final member of his crew and one of its most dedicated, Catherine Coulson. She and Jack were married at the time, and Coulson was supposed to have played the minor role of a nurse who hands Henry and Mary their mutated baby, something which was eventually never filmed, and the few scenes he did appear in were cut out of the final version. But although she did little on screen, her contribution behind the camera was invaluable, as like with Doreen Small, Coulson took on many sundry roles on set, serving as a camera assistant to Herb Cartwell and later Fred Elms, while also helping with props and often cooking for the crew, or bringing in leftovers from her waitressing job. And although she was uncredited for it, she was the one who maintained her husband's hair throughout the shoot. As unconventional as David's quick casting was, it was nothing compared to how he directed his actors. 
Just like with every other aspect of the production, the acting had to be off kilter. Most of Eraserhead's characters give off a feeling that there is something wrong with them. Both Henry and Mary are clearly riddled with anxiety and have a deep dissatisfaction with their lot in life. And Mary's parents are the strangest of all, her mother regulating from seething rage to built up lust to whatever this is. And her father, although one of the few characters who smiles in the entire movie, has something wrong going on as well. His plastered on grin hiding an anchor which is seen when he rants about the state of the world. Well, Prince your business, huh? Mom, it's mine. 30 years. I've seen this neighborhood change from pastures to the hell home it is now. A great aspect of these performances is the contrast between the old and young. Henry and Mary are both dissatisfied and anxious, but they still maintain some modicum of sanity, while Mary's parents have just about lost it, perhaps broken down over their long life in Eraserhead's industrial hellscape. And one can also guess that if they live long enough, Henry and Mary would end up the same. When it came to directing his actors, Lynch used extensive rehearsals to get the choreography of each scene right. Jack Nance practicing every movement, no matter how minute, until he got them down to a T. He would also allow his actors to come up with their own ideas, like the time he let Charlotte Stewart design her own dress and make it ill-fitting, because he felt that was what Mary would do. And to help her get into Mary's insecure mindset, Lynch dripped liquids into her ear to fake an infection, an unseen detail but something which contributed to her performance. Now, with every set secured, every actor cast and the crew fully manned, Eraser had made steady if sluggish progress, though there was nothing indicating that it would take as long to finish as it did. But then the production would hit its first of many hurdles, as Lynch used up what meager budget AFI had granted him and was refused further funding, AFI only allowing him free use of the staples and their equipment. That along with upheavals in Lynch's personal life would send him into one of the darkest periods of his life and nearly doom the production. In the spring of 1973, Lynch was stuck with an unfinished film and no money to continue it. To make matters worse, people from AFI would come down to the set to take pieces of equipment, promising to return them, something which never happened. Many crew members would also leave for other employment. Fred Elms took Catherine Coulson with him to work on John Cassavetti's The Killing of a Chinese Bookie. Doreen Small left the project for good after moving to Santa Barbara, having pretty much finished her work on it, and Alan Splatt had gone to a weird utopian community in Scotland led by people who believed they could commune with nature spirits. Though despite this, they all remained in close contact, most with the exception of Small returning once shooting resumed. This is a testament to Lynch's natural talent as a leader. It is important to note that these people were essentially spending most of their time on what was a student film made by an untested director while getting paid less than minimum wage, some of them working full-time jobs at the same time, and most would probably be right to leave thinking nothing would come of it. But Lynch has an incredible talent for gaining people's trust and loyalty, a natural charisma and amiability which endears people to him so much that they would help him for nearly five years. One reason for this is that most of the Eraserhead crew did not feel like they were working for Lynch but with him, Eraserhead not just being his film but a collaborative effort, and it did not hurt that he made sure to pay the crew a slight wage despite his minuscule budget, and once he could no longer do that, he promised to give everyone a percentage of the film's earnings based on how long they worked on it, something which would pay off down the line as the film found success, each crew member getting a new check in the mail every year decades after the film's premiere. But even though he was able to maintain his crew, there was one relationship which was doomed to fail. As Eraserhead took more and more over Lynch's life, his wife felt she was no longer a part of it, and they were split up, after which Lynch began living on the Eraserhead set illegally, often having to hide from onlookers so no one found out. At that time, he took a job delivering the Wall Street Journal, partly to feed himself and to try to fund his movie. But as time went on, it began to look as if the project was dead in the water, and Lynch was close to building a miniature set and a puppet of Henry so he could finish it using stop motion. But with all of these negative changes going on, there was one positive term which was salvage not only Lynch's mental health but also impact the project in a profound way. He was talking to his sister on the phone one day when he noticed something different about her voice and asked whether something had changed, to which she responded by saying that she had started practicing transcendental meditation. Intrigued by this, Lynch went to the nearest transcendental meditation center and learned to meditate, something which he does to this day, claiming he has never missed a session. Developed by the yoga guru Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, transcendental meditation is a simple, near effortless form of mindfulness, which only involves the participant closing their eyes for 20 minutes while citing a mantra silently for two sessions a day. 
Its proponents claim that doing so will relieve stress, lower blood pressure, and improve one's mental and physical health, including Lynch, who became so gung-ho about the practice that he set up an entire foundation to promote and teach it. He has maintained that transcendental meditation saved his life when he discovered it, as during that one year when it looked as if Eraserhead would fizzle into nothing, he was considering suicide as a way out. His whole demeanor would change as well. Before meditation, he was filled with anger and anxiety, and often took it out on his wife. But then, After I had been meditating for about two weeks, she came to me and said, What's going on? I was quiet for a moment, but finally I said, What do you mean? And she said, This anger, where did it go? And I hadn't even realized it had lifted. But besides the boost in mental health, Lynch has also claimed that transcendental meditation had salutary benefits to his creativity. As an analogy, he describes ideas as fish, and consciousness as the water these fish swim in. So by expanding consciousness through transcendental meditation, one is able to catch bigger fish or get better ideas. And it was during this time that he caught one of his biggest ideas yet, one which would change the direction of Eraserhead's narrative. In a sense, Henry's story is about him wanting to escape from his tower life, but in the earlier drafts of the script, he had no way to realize this want. That was until Lynch got the idea for the lady in the radiator. He was sitting in the food room one day, drawing, and got the idea for a woman with giant cheeks who had little fetuses falling out of her. And after drafting her, he wrote down the lyrics for In Heaven and thought she should live in the radiator where It's nice and warm. As luck would have it, there was a tiny compartment inside the radiator in the set for Henry's room, just the perfect place for his new creation to live. It was then that he changed the film's original ending where Henry was supposed to be eaten by the giant version of his mutated child and replaced it with something a bit more optimistic. Henry finding some peace after his ordeal. Or at least one can interpret it that way. To play the lady, Lynch hired singer Laurel Near for the sole reason that he liked her smell, which he then hid under layers of thick makeup. And despite Near being an experienced singer, he had someone else do the vocals for her musical number, new wave musician Peter Ivers, who would also compose the song's music. It would be one of the first sequences shot after a long hiatus, at the end of which most of the crew had gathered, excluding Doreen Small and Alan Splat. And just when things were going up mentally for Lynch and his project was back on track, his financial situation would improve as well, when Jack Fisk came to his aid. At the time, Fisk started what would become a long career as a production designer and art director, and had worked with acclaimed directors like Terence Malick on Badlands and Brian De Palma on The Phantom of the Paradise, which earned him more than enough money to put into the film. But his aid did not end there, as he would also play the man in the planet, seen in the film's beginning and end. So things were locking up, the film was on a roll and on track to finishing, Lynch was in a far better state of mind, and he had just stumbled upon one of the film's most important and iconic ideas. But his troubles did not end there, as at the end of 1974 Lynch was ordered to vacate the staples and was only given 30 hours to finish the last few shots. It was an exhaustive task, but the crew managed, and with everything done on set, Lynch moved into a guest house with a double garage, which he turned into his post-production facility. Now all that remained were a few special effects shots which were done in Fred Elms' living room, along with the sound design. It was then that Alan Spett returned from Scotland, and the three of them would get to work finishing the film between the years 1975 and 1976, managing to get a rough cut done for an unofficial premiere at AFI. But even with the film finished, Lynch's troubles did not end there, as Eraserhead's eventual road to success was not a smooth one. But before we get to that, I would like to explain what David Lynch was trying to do with his film, and why it has garnered the praise and adoration it has. I would like to explain what the point of Eraserhead is. It is a, a personal film, and no reviewer or critic or viewer um, has ever uh, given an interpretation that is my interpretation since the, you know, 25 years it's, or more that it's been out. Is that true? Well, even if someone were to figure out his intended meaning, it is unlikely he would confirm it, though he has given some clues as to how he interpreted it, saying that while he was trying to figure out what his movie was about, he read a random sentence from the Bible and... I closed the Bible because that was it, that was it, and then I saw the thing as a whole, and it fulfilled this vision for me, 100%. As to what he read, well... I don't think I'll ever say what that sentence was. 
Now, as much as I would love to figure out what that quote was, I would need to search through the entire Bible. And the Bible is, uh, well, quite long. But I don't think we need to dig that deep to figure out what erase hat means, as the clues might lie in Lynch's own life. It is hard to miss the parallels between Henry Spencer and David Lynch. Like his character, Lynch had become a father by accident, and although his daughter looks nothing like this, she was born with a deformity, clubbed feet, something which took extensive surgeries to correct. The parallels do not end there. Henry works as a printer at Lapel's factory. Prior to making a razor head, Lynch worked as a printer and engraver for a man named Roger Lapel. The house of Mary's parents shared the same number as Lynch's house in Philadelphia, and although this occurred after the script for a razor head was finished, Lynch did spit with his wife, just like Henry. All of this is to say that Eraserhead is a strange form of abstract symbolic autobiography, Lynch channeling his paternal fears and anxieties into the picture, Eraserhead being about the fear of one's life getting taken over by their child, something which can be seen in the two shots where Henry's head is replaced with that of his progeny, and also in the original ending where Henry gets eaten by it. Which makes one wonder what he felt about his daughter when he made this scene. <laughs> Though that's only half an explanation, as he does not account for the lady in the radiator. So what's her deal? Well, there is the rather morbid explanation that she is representative of Henry's suicidal ideation. That the song in heaven, as cheerful as it is, has much darker meaning, being about Henry's desire to end his life, to go to heaven where everything is fine. One can say that Henry does commit suicide at the end after killing his child. A theory made even more morbid if one wonders if the way the child is portrayed in the film is only how Henry sees it, that it is not a cackling demonic parasitic monster, but just an innocent child, and that Henry only perceives it as being so due to his growing insanity. But there is a slight problem here. As explained before, the lady in the radiator came to Lynch during a period when his mood was brightening, and every aspect of her indicates that she represents something a bit more positive. To begin with, why does she live in the radiator? Well, because it's warm there meaning that the lady is a symbol of warmth, similar to the titular grandmother of his third short film. There is also a shift in tone during her first scene, the industrial drones receding for the more cheerful music, something which only happens again at the end during the film's credits after Henry has embraced the lady. And finally, during two of her appearances, there is a dramatic shift in lighting, the film's usual darkness disappearing as the world lights up for Henry. All of this leads me to believe that the lady in the radiator is not representative of something as dark as suicide, but rather the opposite, Henry deciding not to end his life, but to better it instead, just as Lynch had done when he conceived of the lady. Furthermore, one can also claim that the baby is not supposed to be a literal baby, but a symbol of his nagging, ever-growing depression and anxiety. So when he kills it, he is not committing infanticide, but freeing himself from his darker emotions. To further expand on this, we need to go back to transcendental meditation, because there exists within the practice something known as the unified field theory of consciousness, which may go a long way to explain what is going on in the ending of Eraserhead. So in physics, there exists the unified field theory, which is an attempt to describe all fundamental forces and elementary particles using a single theoretical framework i.e. the four fundamental forces, strong interaction, electromagnetic interaction, weak interaction, and gravitational interaction, along with the elementary particles, or particles not composed of other particles, all emerge from a single field, an unmanifest field of nothingness from which everything has emerged. Some practitioners of transcendental meditation, including Lynch, believe this field to be pure consciousness, and that by meditating, one turns their consciousness inward, and transcends to this field, and experiences unbounded intelligence, creativity, happiness, love, energy, and peace. Linz believes that negativity recedes due to this transcendence, that things like post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety, fear, stress, depression, tension, sorrow, hate, and anger all lift away. 
So, in short, Eraserhead is about a man suffering from severe negative emotions who eventually frees himself from them and transcends into a field of pure consciousness, which may explain what Lynch meant by this. Believe it or not, Eraserhead is my most spiritual film. But that's only one kind of interpretation. It is also possible to analyze the film without knowledge of the context behind it. For example, one can interpret Eraserhead as a critique of capitalism. Under this lens, the desolate state of Eraserhead's world is due to environmental catastrophes caused by an increase in industrialization, the ever-growing need for economic growth leading to nature getting snuffed out by the building of factories and the waste they produce. Furthermore, one can guess that the cause of Henry's depressed state is due to the dehumanizing treatment he receives as a member of the working class, the feeling that he is disposable, another cock in the machine, as trite as that sounds. One can also view the dream that his head gets replaced by his child as not being about the fear of the baby taking over his life, but about his fear of one day outliving his use as a worker and getting replaced by his progeny. Now, I admit it is unlikely that this is what Lynch intended. He has never shown much interest in politics, and the likelihood that he would have an interpretation as left-leaning as that one is not strong. He was a Reagan supporter for God's sake. But does that matter? I began this part by wondering what Lynch's intent was. But that's missing the point, as it doesn't matter what he intended. When Lynch made Eraserhead, he was not trying to impose his own meaning onto the audience. If he were, he would not be so tight-lipped about it. And, uh, would you like to expound on that a little? No. What was that thump? You'd have to wait and find out. No, I won't explain it. I won't explain it. Um, uh, why, why, we'll elaborate on that. No, I won't. Um, <laughs> I know you hate saying what things mean in your films, but am I right in thinking that that's at least in the right area? No. <laughs> no, Lynch wants people to see Eraserhead under a total veil of ignorance. A film should stand on its own. It's absurd if a filmmaker needs to say what a film means in words. The world in the film is a graded one, and people sometimes love going into that world. For them, that world is real, and if people find out certain things about how something was done, or how this means this, or that means that, the next time they see the film, these things enter into the experience, and then the film becomes different. I think it's so precious and important to maintain that world, and not say certain things that could break the experience. He wants his films to act as a sort of Rorschach test, where each individual viewer is able to come to their own interpretation. And this is the heart of Eraserhead's appeal. The fact that one is able to read into it their own way allows the viewer to come up with an interpretation which is far more appealing and valuable to them than whatever Lynch intended. This increases their enjoyment of the movie. Be it autobiographical, pessimistic, optimistic, or something else, Eraserhead's avenues to interpretation are vast as long as one opens up to it. And remember, you fuckhead. That is the stupidest thing you interpreted there. That said, there is a danger in interpreting a Lynch film as mystery is vital to their appeal and effectiveness. So by fully analyzing Eraserhead, it is possible one is decreasing their enjoyment, because there is no mystery anymore. I myself had not been able to find the same sense of intrigue watching it now as when I first viewed it, because I fell into the trap of overanalyzing, and have had to try recreating that initial viewing experience by coming up with more interpretations. That sense of mystery would become a vital part of the film's eventual success, but first it had to jump over a few stumbling blocks, as Eraserhead's journey into the annals of cinematic history would be a slow one, even after its completion. Eraserhead had an unofficial premiere at AFI, which for a while seemed to be the only time the film would ever get shown to a large audience, as after that showing, Lynch would send the film to both the Cannes and New York Film Festival, getting rejected from both. After these two rejections, Lynch doubted he would ever get the film into a single festival, and seemed to have succumbed to the idea that his movie would never get shown at all. So after nearly five years worth of painstaking effort, it looked as if Eraserhead had hit its final roadblock. But someone had just entered Lynch's life who would change this course and prove indispensable to the film's completion. He had started dating a woman named Mary Fisk, the little sister of his friend Jack, and she would contribute to the film in two ways. First, she had convinced a family friend to invest $10,000 into the project, which Lynch spent on post-production. And second, she would convince Lynch to send his film to the Los Angeles International Film Exposition, or Filmex for short, where it was accepted and shown officially for the first time. Though Lynch's work on the film did not stop there, he went to the showing and watching it with an audience made him realize that the film needed some trimming. So before its next showing, Lynch cut 20 minutes off it and made the final version of Eraserhead, removing four scenes from the film, one in which Henry is kicking the furniture in the lobby of his apartment building, 
another in which Catherine Cosin and a friend of hers are tied to a bed and threatened by a man with an electrical device, along with some extraneous scenes like Mary's parents bringing her home from the hospital, Henry talking on the phone, and a scene of Mary having a fit, along with the scene of two men fighting outside of Henry's window, a piece of which is still seen in the movie. With a finished pared down version of the film in hand, Lynch was ready to go even farther with it, and lucky for him, Filmex would lead to a meeting with a man who would bring Eraserhead to an even wider audience, Ben Barinholtz. Barinholtz had pioneered a method of film distribution known as the Midnight Movie, which entailed taking films that were not commercially viable enough to advertise the traditional way, and showing them at midnight for a long theater run, allowing them to slowly build up an audience through word of mouth. He had nursed several films towards success by doing this at his Algian Theatre in New York, displaying films like Alejandro Jodorowsky's El Topo and John Waters' Pink Flamingos, which would never be distributed otherwise. Eraserhead was a perfect fit for his Algian Theatre, where it was shown to a small audience at first. But as time went on, Eraserhead began grabbing more people's attention, spreading through the recommendations of those who had seen it. I think one reason for this is the film's sense of mystery and openness to interpretation. If an audience member walks out of the theater with questions about what the film was about or what its themes were, and if they are curious enough, then the film will stick longer in their memory and increase the chances that an audience member will watch it again or recommend it. And one audience member in particular would help tremendously in this process, John Waters, who liked the movie so much that he told people to see it instead of his own film, Desperate Living, which was showing at the same time. Waters would be the first of many celebrity admirers of the film, which included artist H.R. Geeker, author Charles Bukowski, and other fellow directors like William Friedkin and Stanley Kubrick, who was said to have considered Eraserhead his favorite movie, and had allegedly shown it to the cast and crew of The Shining to get them in the right mood. But none of these admirers would be as important to Lynch's career as Mel Brooks. Yes, that Mel Brooks. May the Schwartz be with you who liked Eraserhead so much that he would hire Lynch to direct his next movie, The Elephant Man. And after that, Lynch's career would take off, The Elephant Man leading him to direct Dune, which yes, was a creative failure to him, but that movie led to Blue Velvet, which led to Twin Peaks, and so on and so on, each project leading to the next. And it all began with a rinky-dink little production of a film which, according to common wisdom, should not have been as successful as it was. But more importantly, it was thanks to Eraserhead's success that David Lynch realized his dream of living the art life, as even while he's not making movies, he's always busy on something, be it painting, making music, or building things like whatever this is. The incredible checking stick. You set the tab on your heart and you get a feeling. You get a feeling for what you're focusing on. Then you set the tab on your brain and you get a thinking of what is going on with what you're focusing upon. And you put those two things together and it can help you indicate the next move. But you don't really need a checking stick because every human being has what they call intuition. As to what happened to the rest of the crew, well, Alan Splatt would continue his career as a sound designer, working on most of David's projects until his death in 1994. Herb Cartwell would not be so lucky, dying under mysterious circumstances at the age of 35 before he could even see the movie. Frederick Elms, however, would have a long and still ongoing career behind the camera, working as DP for directors like Ang Lee, Jim Jarmusch and Charlie Kaufman, and he would work with Lynch again on Blue Velvet and Wild at Heart. Catherine Coulson would have a steady career behind the camera as well, working as camera assistant on a wide range of films like Jim Jarmusch's Night on Earth and Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan. But she would also go in front of the camera as an actress, her most notable role of course being the log lady from Twin Peaks. Jack Fisk would continue his career as production designer and art director, working on films like The Thin Red Line, There Will Be Blood, The Revenant and two of David's films, The Stray Story and Mulholland Drive. Doreen Small, on the other hand, would seemingly end her film career, going into law school after Eraserhead wrapped up. As for the actors, well, both Judith Roberts and Alan Joseph would have steady careers, mostly playing minor roles, Roberts still acting to this day, but neither one would appear in another Lynch project, while Jeannie Bates and Charlotte Stewart would work with him again. Bates appearing in Mulholland Drive, and Charlotte Stewart playing the wife of Major Briggs on Twin Peaks' three seasons. And finally, there is Jack Nance 
would appear in almost every Lynch project until his sudden death in 1996 at the age of 53, save for The Elephant Man, which he was supposed to star in until John Hurt took the role, and Twin Peaks Fire Walk With Me, which he was cut out of. Ultimately, Eraserhead is proof of three things. One, it is a testament to David Lynch's talent, as it takes a special kind of director to achieve what he did with the limited resources of Eraserhead, while at the same time a good example of the importance of collaboration in filmmaking. For without the generous help, patience and hard work of his crew and all those that aided him, the movie would never have materialized. And finally, it not only pushed the boundaries of what a film could do, but also who could make them, as its existence is proof that with enough creativity, hard work and dedication, it is possible to make a great film without the help of major studios and on a shoestring budget. And at its core, that is what the story behind Eraserhead is all about. One man without any major connections in the entertainment industry and a fraction of most feature film budgets and resources, breaking through the confines of his limitations and making something amazing. Something that has taken its rightful place in cinematic history as one of the most bizarre and groundbreaking films ever made. If you've made it this far, then I want to thank you for watching. And if you've enjoyed what you've seen here, then feel free to like and subscribe for more videos like this. And if you know of any other films with interesting production histories behind them, which you think could make good material for another video, then write it down in the comments below.